we embarked on the Mars Orbiter mission. Like I said, uh, after exactly after 50 years of the first sounding rocket from TAS, on the 5th of November, we had the launch of this Mars mission. It was originally designed for orbiting around Mars with a life of about six months. And in this, there was going to be many firsts because this was for the first time that we were going to get out of the Earth's sphere of influence, get into heliospheric orbit and then get on to Mars and get captured on the Mars for orbiting around the Mars. And because there was going to be very long periods where there is no communication possible between the satellite and the ground station, it was necessary that you build in a large amount of autonomy features on the satellite and these features should enable the satellite to take care of itself without any communication from ground. And then it also had the scientific objective of exploring the Mars surface morphology and then Martian atmosphere by indigenous scientific instruments. This as I said was launched on the 5th of November. Then the Trans-Mars injection happened on the 30th of November. Then the Mars spacecraft left the sphere of influence of Earth on the 4th of December 2013. Then a series of uh, trajectory correction maneuvers and then it got inserted into the Mars orbit on the September 24th of 2014. And this also resulted in a significant amount of uh, enthusiasm being generated across the country among the scientific community and also the students. What picture you are seeing here is on the time, at the time of insertion, many of the schools were celebrating this particular event. That's what you are seeing from this picture. Now the trajectory itself that was chosen was very unique and we had to do this primarily because the launcher what we had, the PSLV, could carry only about 1400 kilograms. And within this mass, we had to build in sufficient uh, velocity injection capability into the satellite. And we went through a series of elliptical orbits. And then we also had to make sure that the propulsion system that are used are called for operation again after a long gap of about nine months, which is unlike what happens in most of our other satellites. The propulsion system itself was the same as what we used for our geostationary satellite, communication satellite. But in those cases what happens is the elliptical orbit of uh, about 200 km to 24,000 km is converted into 36,000 km circular using the propulsion system. And propulsion system, once the job is completed in about a month's time, it is shut down. Whereas in this case, it was required for us to operate it after a gap of about nine months. So that was one of the challenges. Then of course the other challenges were, we were going to go almost about uh, 400 million kilometers away from Earth. So you need to have a deep space communication capability. Then the other aspect is, the time it takes for a signal what you send can go up to 20 minutes to reach the satellite from ground. So that means by the time you know what happens, whatever command you have sent, it takes about 40 minutes back and forth. So you need to build in a large amount of autonomy onto the satellite. And all these uh, visualization of the kind of autonomy that is needed for has been demonstrated because recently we went through the solar conjunction phase where Sun, Earth and Mars came in the same line. And for almost about one month, we had practically no communication with the satellite. We have gone through this phase and now subsequently we have operating, we are operating all the payloads and the systems are working fine. And because of the significant amount of fuel that is still left, the mission is likely to last for a very long time. Now there were five payloads which were there on this particular uh, satellite. We had the Lyman Alpha photometer, then the methane sensor, then you have the Mars exospheric composition analyzer, then the Mars color camera and also a thermal infrared spectrometer. And we had a series of uh, challenges, whether it is from the structure, mechanism, propulsion, thermal, then power, communication. And communication, apart from the distance involved, 
we also had to make sure that um, the field of view of the antenna that is there on the satellite was only 2 degrees and so this requires the satellite attitude to be very carefully controlled so that the ground antennas receive the signal care without interference. Then the trajectory analysis and also determining the orbit itself was one of the key issues. Then during the course of its journey it also took a large number of images. Then this is one of the highest volcanoes which were seen on the solar system, Olympus Mars. Then you can also see some of the images taken <laughs> from this. This is the cloud formation is near the Elysium which is the second largest volcanic province. Then these are images of different regions on different dates and different resolutions. In fact, we had to resort to a highly elliptical orbit in this because of the limited uh, fuel available and this highly elliptical orbit itself gave us some very significant advantages which we will see subsequently. These are some of the images taken from this Mars color camera and draped over the digital elevation model and those you can also see the wind streaks on the images and the color camera itself you can decode the individual wavelengths and then extract information. This also shows that uh, some of the clouds carbon dioxide present on the and this is another very interesting observation which is again recently corroborated with Maven data and it is going to earlier it was felt that all the dust that is present on the surface of the Mars will not lift up to a very large height whereas here we are seeing just beyond the limb up to 200 kilometers up to almost 300 kilometers there is a segment which is seen and this is a very interesting data and lot of uh, <coughs> studies are going to be done on the basis of these observations and this is another interesting thing Phobos and Deimos these were the moons and we have the capability to take the images with 10 second gap and then based on that you can see one of the moons traversing on the Mars surface and this is the one which is very interesting because we are the only people so far who have seen the far side of this Deimos because all the other orbiting satellites on Mars do not have an opportunity to see the far side of this particular moon of Mars and we are now planning to target a series of observations which can extract some more <laughs> details of the far side of the moon. And then we also have the methane sensor large amount of data has been collected and of course still significant amount of work needs to be done to extract uh, the specific methane surfaces. This is one of the uh, methane sensor outputs in 1.65 micron and again this is we are the only people who are actually making observation in 1.65 micron on the surface of moon. This is a reflectance map using the reference channel and similarly using the methane channel and the differences. So we still need to do a lot of work before we can extra actually extract uh, the methane content itself and its distribution but there are interesting results which are coming out. Then Menka also has found carbon dioxide altitudinal variations and then we are able to make observations with time gap and this is also going to give a significant amount of uh, interesting results. Then you have the lab, one of the data of the lab which shows as a function of limb height what is the kind of observation that is seen. Then you also have the thermal imaging spectrometer which is giving this data. Now like I said the spacecraft autonomy, the maximum Earth to Mars round trip is about 42 minutes then we have the onboard autonomy is implemented through autonomous fault detection, isolation, reconfiguration. Then we have to make sure that there is a continuous watching, fault detection, isolation. Then also safeguarding the spacecraft during the Mars orbit injection. And then we, since there is also a power issue, TWTI is duty cycle. And like I said, between 10th June and 2nd July, we went through the longest period of no communication between the satellite and the ground 
And once we have crossed this hurdle, now we can say that the, in the immediate vicinity there are no issues. All the subsystems on this satellite are functioning very well and we expect it to last for quite a significant amount of time. And recently we have also announced the announcement of opportunity for using the data of all the Mars instruments and this announcement of opportunity has been put up in our website. Anybody who is interested in using this data making analysis can put up proposals and then go ahead and carry out their R&D and then research activities on them. 